Well, we are in session six of our review of the book of Genesis. And uh, before we start, um, I want to do a little background piece, if I may. Um, I have a, just got, not long ago, a new watch that I'm really quite pleased with for a number of reasons. Um, it actually is a, a, a pretty new watch. If I told you, of course, that a group of engineers got together to design this watch and, and, the, and uh, they handed the design to some very skilled technicians that did what they needed to do and it finally went to a very skilled factory that put it together and that factory sent it to a wholesaler who sent it to a, a jeweler who sold it to the person that gave it to me as a gift. You'd probably believe me, wouldn't you? But let me tell you, that's not what happened at all. Millions and millions of years ago. <laughs> well, why are you laughing? <laughs> millions and millions of years ago, there were some atoms randomly floating through the universe. And through cosmic winds and gravitational fields and who knows what, they started to come together and coalesce to become various materials. There's a clear piece of glass, I guess it is, and and so forth, and it's amazing. Some of it is a special kind of silicon, so it's, it gets its energy from the sun. It doesn't need batteries or it needs to be wine, and so on and so forth. And, and obviously I could go on, but I can look at your faces and you, tell, you don't believe me. <laughs> you don't believe me at all, do you? You won't believe that this watch happened by accident. And yet it is trivial compared to the wrist on which it resides. The watch is an open loop system. It has some mechanics that are, then, that are open loop. This one happens not to be open loop because it gets a radio signal to keep it on time. But the point is, the wrist it resides on is a closed loop system. And there's probably not one engineer in a thousand that knows how to do an Nyquist resolution of the feedback loops involved or something like that. Not only is it a closed loop system, it is self-healing. It attacks invaders. I mean, I could go on and on about my wrist. And from a design point of view, it's astonishing what it does compared to the watch. And you won't let me teach the kids that the watch had to be designed. And yet you insist that I teach the kids, the, the, those deprived children that are stuck with government schools, at least, um, that... Um, the wrist happened by accident, that somehow inorganic rocks came together and made life and that life got more and more clever. And, and you know, the, the whole story is you can't probably contrive a more ridiculous scenario than the scenario that is forced upon our public, not just in the schools with the textbooks that have deliberate deceit in them. But in our culture, all our fields of interest, whether it's psychology, law, whatever, is influenced by this commitment to the idea that millions and millions of years ago, all this just happened. The most elaborate insult to the creator that man has ever contrived. The ancient cultures worshipped idols, which wasn't good, but not nearly as insulting as arguing that a creator wasn't necessary. It's, uh, it, anyway, so we're going to hit this head on because in our sequence of days, we're going to start today, this day, with life, what life is all about. So the fifth day, and uh, we're in chapter one of Genesis. As you may recall, for those of you that have joined midstream here, we had an introduction session about the Torah. We know who wrote the books of Moses because we have inside information. None other than the Lord Jesus Christ clearly identified the author of these five books, particularly Genesis. He quotes from them and so forth, makes a big point of that. We spent some time also talking about the nature of time because it's widely misunderstood. But with that background, we jumped into day one. And we explored some conjectures called the gap theory and other things and also explored th this mysterious thing we called light, which still is one of the most elusive mysteries in, in science and in, in particle physics and so forth. But that set the stage for the second day, we'll call it Monday, and we talked about space itself. We talked a little bit about the Big Bang models and the fact that space is not empty, it has 
it, the fabric of space has mass and energy. It has one cubic centimeter of empty vacuum space has more energy than 100 million suns. Zero point energy. We got into all of that. Talked a little about hyperdimensions and that sort of stuff, quantum physics. That sets the stage for Tuesday, where we have life in the sense of vegetation. We talked a little bit about the origin of life and thermodynamics and molecular chemistry in a, in a modest way. Then we went to the fourth day, Wednesday, where the stars and the planets. It inst it's interesting that the Earth was present before the sun. That shocks a lot of people. But uh, that's what the Lord tells us. And uh, we talked about why are there stars in the heavens? The Lord put them there for signs. We explored that a little bit, both in terms of mnemonics to a, a layout of God's plan of redemption and also the fact that the, the Jewish catechism is the calendar. And that brings us, of course, to the fifth day. We are now on Thursday, and we're talking a little bit about uh, uh, evolution because we're, get con we're confronted now not just with plants but with animals, specifically fish and birds. And uh, so... Let's jump in and take a look at the text. We'll start from the beginning because we're so close to the beginning. Let's start from the beginning because there are some that may have joined us fresh. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. New paragraph. If you understand that sentence, you'll have no trouble with any other passage in the Bible. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God brooded or moved upon the face of the waters. And God said... Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were day one, not the first day. Second, third, and fourth are relative. The first one's absolute, day one. And God said, let there be a firmament, a rakia, in the midst of the waters, let divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so, and God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And we use this as an opportunity to explore in our previous sessions the whole nature of the fabric of space and particle, what we know now from quantum physics and the rest of it. And then God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place, let dry land appear, and let it was so, and God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters, he called the seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, and this, whose seed is in itself, and the earth upon the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. And we talked about how underneath this text is encrypted 25 trees that appear in the Bible. Another subtle evidence of design that hidden in the Hebrew of this passage are the names of all the trees that appear in the rest of the Bible. Genesis 1 verse 14, God said, Let the lights be in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Let them be lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. It was so, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Now here we are for tonight. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales. Actually, the term is sea monster in Hebrew and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them and saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. One small editorial comment. You'll notice all through this, and especially in the day that's coming in the next session, the idea of being fruitful and multiplying has God's blessing. One of the myths, one of the errors of Western, the decline of Western civilization is to deny that. You see, Satan is out to undo everything God has ordained in the book of Genesis. We'll notice that as we go through the book. God wants us to be fruitful and multiply. Satan wants abortion and euthanasia. These are out of the pit of hell. And... Uh, but we'll move on. Let's go ahead here. 
Now, we have been going through this looking at an entropy profile of the universe, where entropy is randomness or disorder. And the chart's been drawn with the, the maximum disorder at the bottom of the chart and order at the top, if you will. And in the first day, we notice each day is segmented by an Erev and a Boker. Now, Erev originally referred to chaos or disorder. And as things get dark, is when you no longer can discern. It, it's a move much toward disorder. In the morning, when things are dark and confused, as the dry light comes, you can begin to discern in the order that's around you. Those words later come, become to mean Erev meaning evening and Boker meaning morning. But it's my contention that's not the real original purpose of these words in this passage. If Erev and Boker were the first day, then the day is only in the nighttime. From evening till morning, that's the day. No, no. It is because of this language, that the, and one of the reasons, that the Jewish calendar starts at sundown, from sundown to sundown, rather than midnight to midnight, the way we re-render it. But Erev and, if Erev and Boker make a first day, we got an awkward. It's only a 12-hour day, if you follow me. Those words originally, we think, had a different connotation. And so we know in the first day, it was Erev and Boker made the first day, and that's when we had light, and that's where we discussed some of the peculiar properties of light. Then Erev and Boker made up the second day, and we talked about the plasma, the physics, the four states of matter, and so forth. And then we went to the third day, where we had Erev and Boker, and we had the vegetation and the so forth. The dry land appears and so on. And then we went to the uh, fourth day, and we had the planets and the sun and the stars. It's interesting to realize that we have the earth with vegetation and plants. Where's the light coming from? Anybody want to make a guess? God, you betcha. Absolutely. How interesting. And now we have the Erev and Boker of the fifth day, which has life, as we think of it in terms of animals, showing up initially uh, in both sea creatures and birds. But, we're, but the real issue is this whole issue of life. And that's why I wanted to go through my little watch idea. The little watch thing that I used to open this session obviously was not original with me. It's a very famous example that was presented by uh, Bishop Pally back in 1818. As I pointed out, the watch is a simple open loop system. I want, you, I want to give you a little background in design because once you have anybody that's been in this design team really understands how stupid it is to ascribe the things we, around us to chance. The wrist that the watch wrists on is a closed loop servo. That's an order of magnitude much more complicated than the watch. The wrist adapts to ambient conditions. It fights off invaders. And it is self-repairing. How many of you have a self-repairing watch? OK. What Bishop William Pally in 1818 suggests the watch, and in those days the watches were different, but still the watch with its gears and springs and other mechanisms could never arise by random chance alone. That stands on its own feet. In, in 1779, David Hume is famous for challenging that line of reasoning. He said, living systems only have the appearance of machines. Unless it can be proven that living systems are indeed machines at the molecular level, then Pally's watchmaker argument is irrelevant. And that sounded good back in 1779, but is shredded by modern science. And uh, uh, modern microbiology, among other things, in fact, almost every field of science, has revealed that even the most simplest organisms are complex machines beyond our imagining. And I want to try to get across that, some of that with you today. Science has refuted Hume and totally vindicated Pally. And that's not just my view. Sir Fred Hoyle, in 1981, pointed out the speculation of origin of the species turned out to be wrong. It is ironic that the scientific facts throw Darwin out but leave Pally the ultimate winner. It's so logical, so straightforward. I want to give you a little perspective before we get into some of the other discussions. An open loop system has a source of energy, some mechanism, and then something happens. A display is the simplest case. A thermometer on your wall is an open-loop system, as an example. You can add something to that if you have a reference point and a sensor to me measure the ambient and compare it to a reference point. It can actuate a mechanism to make a change. You have that on your thermostat at home. You set a datum, the temperature you want. There's a device in there that will measure the temperature in the ambient and the temperature you want, and if there's a difference, it'll 
instructs the machinery to turn on to correct the difference. That's called, that happens to be called, a closed loop system. <laughs> closed loop systems are far more complicated than they appear at first. For example, you can open a window and overheat your house. Because the open window can cool the sensor and it thinks it's cold but it's not and you, you get the picture. Most social systems are closed loop systems with non-obvious behavior. Example, you've got, you're running a bus line in the city. It's going broke. So you raise the bus fares. So fewer people ride the bus, and you go even more broke. <laughs> See, sometimes the obvious thing you think you're doing, it operates often counterintuitively, especially markets. Anytime you tamper with the market, you'll get the most bizarre second-order effects. Price, you know, uh, price uh, controls during a war shows that as an example. You create a black market and so on. Anyway, you can make this. In, you can go up another level of complication. You can have one of these closed loop systems and you can add some, some additional material on there. For example, in your heater, you could add a computer to it that knows it's winter or also may know that it takes so long to heat your house so it'll start early. Office buildings typically have an a, uh, air conditioning unit that anticipates what time of day it is and other factors to try to save money and do it more effectively. So that's a form of adaptive control, if you will. And uh, machinery often has machinery that will sense what kind of material it's cutting and make adjustments accordingly, adaptive numerical control and that sort of thing. So they're adaptive systems. Now the evolutionary fallacies, of course, they assume that self-organization can take place. Self-organization is a violation of the entropy laws. Things always go from order to disorder. It takes information to increase those levels. Could a camera most of us have had some cameras with automatic exposure, automatic focusing, all that. Could they have occurred by chance? Of course not. The design of a camera it makes the watch trivial. And yet we would never expect that camera to happen by chance. And we have eyes that are vastly more sophisticated than that camera. And we, yet we deny the, the presence of design. And so, see, self-organization violates the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. Another point to realize, complex systems that are made up of, comp of complicated subassemblies require all the subassemblies to be functional for the system to survive. And uh, I'll give you an example of that. This happens to be a model of the, a Volkswagen auto engine. It has, it has a carburetor system, it has electrical, it has, there's about half a dozen different systems interacting here. If one of them is dysfunctional, it doesn't run. Those subsystems cannot evolve because the whole thing has to be organized in concert. It's not just the probability of a single system operating properly or even several systems operating separately. It's a question of them all operating properly together. Anybody that's been on the design team understands the give and take to, to make even th some of the simplest problems uh, get resolved. And you start talking about, you know, modern fighters with missiles and the complications in these systems are staggering. And the theory of evolution adopts the view that a tornado could go through a junkyard and leave an operational 747 behind. <laughs> That's a famous crack from some time ago. See, there is a hierarchy of design. We've talked about open loop systems, we've talked about closed loop systems, then adaptive systems and self-modifying systems. This leads, as you build up the ladder, you finally get to intelligent machines. Machines that have intelligence. That's something that was un un unthinkable a century ago. And yet we live with it every day. See, there is a concept of having a stored program and some process taking place. A knitting machine is an example. Like a very complicated program. And the knitting machine will organize the threads to pr produce a pattern. That's a typical example of a stored program machine. But the great insight that we're indebted to John von Neumann, the mathematician for, is a situation where in the storage you'd have, where you have the program that's driving the machine, giving the machine the opportunity to change the program. That's what makes a computer different than just a complicated adding machine. You can have a very, very complicated calculator that does very marvelous mathematical calculations, but it's still a calculator. But if that collective system can change its own program, you have a computer. That's what they call the von Neumann architecture. Because in that storage, you have not only the data you want to manipulate, you can have the program, the instructions to manipulate the data. And if you're really clever, you can include the instructions, guidelines, how to change itself to try other things if that doesn't work. 
You can have programs that learn. You can have programs that will try different things. And it'll do it at incredible speeds. When I was in charge of the computer center at the Ford Motor Company, I remember figuring out that we have calculating skills at about a dime a man year. If you sit down with a calculator and figure out how much you could do working eight hours a day, 50 weeks a year, and you run that arithmetic, in those days, the computers we had then could do that same work for about a dime in a fraction of a second, but that's not the point. And so, and I can remember subsequent to that, when I was in the computer industry, I'd left Ford, I, I, I was, uh, uh, among other things, I was chairman of Western Digital for a while. I can remember going around the country pointing out that I had more computer power on my desk at home than I was responsible for when I ran the computer center for the Ford Motor Company. So progress, see, you and I take this progress for granted, but the net of it is, part of that is because we've learned how to make self-modifying machines. You take the process and the storage, add some electronics so you can communicate with it, keyboards or displays or whatever, and you have a, a simple, simplified diagram of a modern computer. When you get into intelligent machines, these are self-modifying, but then the next step in, in the computer industry, in the late 50s, early 60s, we realized that programming a computer was incredible, but it was accident prone because we were dealing in machine language. So we started creating programs that would make the programming easier, and so we had computers programming themselves. We had self-programming systems. You express what you want, and the computer would generate the program. We call those compilers, and there's other names for them. It's the next step to make a computer that can diagnose itself when something's wrong. You can do parity checks, but there's a lot more you can do where the, if something goes, first thing you do aboard ship or in a, on a, on a, in a combat situation with computers, if something seems strange, you run the diagnostics. What do you mean by that? Programs, will, it'll check itself out to find out if it's working properly. There are such things. They're not perfect, but they're very skilled. The next step is self-repairing systems. We're not there yet. But the next dream in the computer arts would be to create a computer. See, we can make computers that will correct errors. The NFSQ27 was one you could take, you could pull cards out while it was running and it would, it would continue because it, it had error correcting logic for, for it used 11 bits per byte rather than eight. And with that you can do three parity checks and tell the position of the error and have it correct. So they built, they actually our air defense systems were built with that kind of uh, design idea. But getting those that if have a problem that fix themselves is not something where they, we're not there yet. But if we could get there, what's the next step? To make self-reproducing ones. And I can remember, even as a kid, I, I saw a little cartoon. It, a guy was tr showing a friend his factory. And in the factory, you had, as far as the eye could see, robots sitting on benches and other robots making them. It was a factory where robots were making more robots. And the guy was telling his friend, I don't know where it's going to all end. You know. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, we don't make self-reproducing systems. We're trying to. We're starting to explore biological components on the chip in, in certain limited ways. But what I'm trying to point out here, as you move up the ladder of design elegance, you, we have not even achieved the design elegance we see all about us. Whether you're looking through a telescope or a microscope, we're bounded by bewildering elegance and skill in the designs around us. And the ultimate one is life itself. With all that we know about life itself, science has not been able to create a synthetic one. Every cell on the planet Earth has come from a previous cell. They don't get created, they, get, they derive from an earlier cell. And uh, we talked earlier in our earlier sessions about the model of an atom. Remember we had a nucleus, an electron going around, the typical model as most people think. And this is of course not to scale. The atom the, uh, is about 10 to the minus 13th, uh, the nucleus is about 10 to the minus 13th, the atoms about 10 to the minus 8th. In other words, there's 100,000 units difference between the nucleus and the radius that that atom spins. In other words, if you take that in a three-dimensional sense, that's 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 5th, which means 10 to the 15th. So if, if, I, if I have a particle here that's the nucleus, and I have an electron spinning around it, the ratio of material to space is the same ratio as one second is to 17 billion years. This podium, which seems so solid, is more... If I say it's empty, 
I'm 100,000 times more accurate than you are by saying it's solid, if, you, if I can express it that way. See, there's a 10 to the 15th in volume difference. But let's get on with this. We obviously, we talked about how hydrogen atoms, oxygen atoms can capture each other's orbits to make a molecule. We don't deal now, we deal on molecules. Even oxygen, we talk about O2, the kind of oxygen we breathe, unless it's ozone, that's O3, but anyway. Now, if you take carbon, carbon has lots of ways to combine. It has been designed to be a combiner, and almost everything you and I deal with through life is a hydrocarbon. Carbohydrates in terms of food, sugars, starches, and so on. Because the complexity, this happens to be a CH4 that I modeled here on the screen. But we're going to talk a little bit. There's a group of very complex molecules called amino acids. They all have a common amino group and a carboxyl acid group, which are like links that allows them to link like a chain. But between those two elements, they have very complex molecules consisting of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms in some combination. The combination determines what kind of amino acid and what properties it has. There are 20 amino acids that account for all life on the planet Earth. 20. And they have some interesting properties. Now, there's a, there's a theory prevalent in our school textbooks that they speak of that way, way back there was some bi a prebiotic soup, okay, a mixture. Typically, they, the, they think it's the primitive atmosphere on the planet Earth. They postulate it would consist, of course, of water, some ammonia, and some methane, and some energy, ultraviolet light or lightning. Somehow, you threw some energy into this gaseous mix, and somehow, magically, atoms got combined to make some of these amino acids. And a guy by the name of Stanley Miller, student in 1953, actually conducted some experiments with lightning and he got a lot of tar and stuff. And he produced, by accident, by, by randomness, so to speak, a few trace elements of amino acids, two of them. But there's some problem, and, and because of that, you'll find that in textbook. Well, that, you know, scientists have actually created some amino acids by chance. So what they don't tell you is they did that, they, they added some very important information. One of the things, they made sure there was no oxygen. Because if there's any oxygen, it would destroy those products. You just get a bunch of tar. Well, that's an interesting point. There's a lot more to the pro more problems to the Stanley Miller experiments that oh, I won't bore you with all that detail. But it turns out oxidation is an enemy of those acids being formed. So is ultraviolet radiation. Will break down that stuff. You see, the ultraviolet radiation will take H2O water with some ultraviolet light. It will break the H2O into some hydrogen and some oxygen molecules and that oxygen molecule wreak havoc. Now, water itself is also an enemy of what they're trying to do. Because these, what they don't tell you in the textbooks is the equations they're talking about are reversible. You take an amino acid and with another amino acid and put it together, you end up with some protein and some water. If you don't do anything else, the water will make it go the other way. The way you make that work is to take the water away then some more amino acid will mix amino acid and give you some more protein and some water. You pull that. You've got to take the water out to drive the equation to the right. Do you follow me? Any chemistry, first year of chemistry in college knows that. They don't tell you that in the textbooks. So water is an enemy of this stuff. And the same thing with the nucleotides. These are the codes that defer, de define the DNA. You take a couple of nucleotides together, you get some DNA, but you also throw off water. To make that work, you've got to get the water out of there. Equilibrium is the enemy of selectivity. If you've got some process going on that by accident makes one of these things, the fact that chemi chemical systems will go towards equilibrium, that means that is unstable. It's going to fall apart. And so, and also time, interestingly enough, this is a shocker to me, with a, time is the enemy of the process. Because the longer you wait, the more likely that it'll achieve equilibrium and destroy the products you're after. You follow me? See, this whole thing falls apart under critical analysis. Well, why doesn't it happen in life? Because of the cell wall. The things that we are going to talk about with amino acids and so forth happen inside the cell. Why? Because the cell has a plasma membrane, which does a lot of things. But first of all, it keeps out the ultraviolet light, and keeps out the water, and keeps out the oxygen to allow these things to happen. So you can't have these things happen until you have a cell wall. Well, wait a minute, what's the cell wall made out of? Yeah, you get the picture. 
Okay, by the way, the cell wall also has gateways that keeps out the proper, improper things, lets in the right things. And the stuff that's in the middle, if they don't know what it is, they give it a fancy name, it's cytoplasm. Um, there's another thing they don't tell you about, is that these complicated molecules, that consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in some mix of some kind, ha are asymmetrical. They have a shape. And that shape, when it's in a fluid, will cause polarized light to polarize a certain way. If it polarizes to the right, they call that a, a, a right-handed molecule. Every right-handed molecule has a symmetrical image that's left-handed. The same molecule, but in, in the reverse order, will give you the mirror image of the first one. You with me? They call that property chirality. You and I would call it left-handedness, you know, left or right-handedness. And if it's right-handed, it's dextrorotary, and it's lever rotary if it's left-handed. Now, the point is, they are toxic to one another. All the DNA or RNA molecules, the nucleotides, are right-handed. All the amino acids in living proteins are left-handed. There are molecules that are the wrong ones and they are toxic. Strychnine is the wrong-handed kind of molecule. Now, the point that's interesting here, they never tell you, if these molecules happen by accident, whatever cause it might be, if it's a true chance, you're going to get half of one and half of the other, right? We don't get half of one and half of the other. We get right-handed ones for DNA. We get left-handed ones for the amino acids. That fact alone tells you that there's selection going on. Someone is guiding the process. You follow me? Okay. See, if we have a room full of people here. Some are left-handed, some right-handed. And if I ask all the left-handed people to go down that hall and all the right-handed people to go down that way, and you ended up doing it right, it wasn't by chance. Somehow you had some checking going on. You follow what I'm trying to say? Okay. It's bad, probably a bad example, but I think you follow my logic. So let's talk a little about the cell. The cell, you know, the whole Darwinian idea hangs on the concept of the simple cell. I want you to put that always in quotes. Because in 1953, Watson and Crick published their landmark document in Nature in which they discovered the DNA and its, its match, the RNA molecules. And by 1955, Sanger had a complete structure of the protein insulin. And of course, in more recent years, they've actually mapped the whole DNA thing. Crick himself, the father of the DNA, so to speak, he said, an honest man armed with all the knowledge available to us now could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. <laughs> no kidding. So many are the conditions which would have had to have had been satisfied to get it going. Michael Denton said it even more clearly back in 1986. Although the tiniest bacterial cells are incredibly small, each is in effect a veritable micro miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery made up of a hundred billion atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. And what does he mean by that? Let's talk about a simple cell. The simplest cell is unparalleled in its complexity and adaptive design. It, it has inside it a central library, a central memory bank. It's surrounded by assembly plants and processing units that rely on that library for instructions. It has repackaging and shipping centers that will take the various products and repackage them for exterior shipment and so forth. All this is done by robot machines in the form of pro protein molecules. They typically involve 3,000 atoms in three-dimensional configurations, and there are hundreds of thousands of specific types that are specified and orchestrated to make all this happen. And there's also an elaborate communication system, and it has quality control centers to catch errors and it has repair centers to fix them. This all happened by chance? You've got to be kidding. Now, if I was going to make a model of this simple cell, let's assume we're going to make a model that's about a thousand million times larger than life. Okay, each atom thus would be about the size of a tennis ball. Can you picture this? We need 10 million million atoms. If we counted them one per minute, it would take us 19 million years to count them. That's a lot of tennis balls. The model, when we're finished, would be over 10 miles in diameter. One cell. One cell. 
Now, um, we talked about the, the cell wall, the cytoplasm. There's a nu nucleus, which is the information center, a master library. And inside that, there's nucleus, which is the automated factories that product, they do product manufacturing. They consult the library what they need, and they take those instructions in the form of a, a copy. They, have, they don't take the original, they take a copy. They may have a copier that checks for errors. And they take the copy of the RNA to, to do what they're supposed to do with it. And that's surrounded by power plants, the microchondrians. They, that's where the energy comes from to make all this happen. We also have the Golgi apparatus, which processes, repackages, ships, and prepares for export, whatever they produced in these factories. That's the cell. And then you've got all kinds of other places where, for storage and for transport and for getting rid of the trash. This thing's organized, all by chance, of course, all by accident. Now, there are robot machines, there's th thousands of different types, there's artificial languages and decoding systems, and that's the mind-blowing thing to me as an information scientist, which is my primary background, that these things are driven by digital codes. Digital codes operate only by prearrangement. It has memory banks for information storage, elegant control systems for regulating the automated assembly, the prefab and module construction, and they have error fail-safe and proofreading devices for quality control. Now, when I was at the Ford Motor Company, I was there some years ago, a senior executive there, and, and uh, one of our proudest assets was the Ford River, uh, Rouge, the Ford River Rouge uh, plant in Dearborn. Huge, huge plant. I think there's something like 97 miles of railroad inside the plant. And what's interesting, raw limestone, iron ore, coal, and uh, silica come in one end. Inside the plant, they make their own paint. They make their own glass. They make their own steel. And they also have automated engine plants. And the raw materials go on one end, and new cars come out the other end. It's the largest integrated manufacturing facility in the world. They're very proud of it. Manufacturing their own steel, glass, and paint. Um, and automated engine plant. And it was fascinating to watch the assembly line, because they all come off different, different models in different colors, because they, they got it set up so they can mix and match, so, and so forth. Now, the point is, The simplest cell in your body is unequaled by any factory on the earth. The simplest cell is more complicated than the Ford River Rouge plant. That's what I'm suggesting. The, th the cell can do something the Rouge plant can't do. It can replicate its entire operation in a matter of a few hours. You have, now you have two, see? All cells derived from previous cells. So we have three, the violation of the entropy laws, the uh, critical system interdependencies, I mentioned this, and the use of digital languages. This is the part that really blows me away. See, digital languages are symbolic codes. If you look at a thermometer, you can tell how high it is, it gives you an approximation of how warm it is. But if you look at a digital watch, which says 8 colon 1 7, that's a digital presentation. That takes logic. The 7 and the 5, the 1, whatever, are there by prearrangement. There's nothing intrinsic about it. Uh, another example is a piano. A violin is an analog device. You can run your finger up and down and get any tone you want. A piano, you're stuck with the specific keys when you push this. That's a, that's a, it's a, in that sense, it's a digital device. Digital codes derive their meaning from arbitrary but consistent definitions. We call that semantics. If I write M-A-N on the blackboard, what does that mean? Man, because we've agreed that's what it means. There's nothing intrinsic about an M and an A and an N. Right? Digital codes are dependent upon their context. And uh, if I put a UAL, UAL, UAL after the man, it means something altogether different, doesn't it? Manual. See, in other words, where the letters appear, part of it. Like another example of that is the famous ride of Paul Revere. One if by land, two if by sea. The, the, the first lantern up in the North, Old North Church carried no information. That just proved the guy didn't fall off the ladder getting there. <laughs> it's that second lantern that told yeah, one if by land, two if by sea. If the British had the most advanced computers in the world, they could not have cracked that code because it has no intrinsic meaning. It's just by prearrangement. Two guys agree, and that's it, you see. Digital codes are absolute evidence of design. They can't happen by accident. See, the whole idea of order and entropy are opposites. We have information as order. Entropy would be errors that get introduced. Order is signal. Entropy is noise. Engineers talk about a signal-to-noise ratio. Music and cacophony, sequence, randomness, design, and chance are opposites to, to each other. And of course, the direction of time is always in the direction towards entropy. When you clean up your locker at school or clean up your desk at home, 
It's just a matter of time before you got to do it all over again. So there's semantics, as I mentioned, the one by land, two by sea, and the syntax. It couldn't be a, it couldn't be in any church. It had to be the landers had to be in the old North Church to have the meaning. So there's a, all this implies coordinated planning, not random accident. So what happens in your cell? You've got the DNA, which is your master blueprint. It doesn't leave the library. It gets unzipped, copied into an RNA, the messenger thing, if you will, like a photocopy machine, and then that gets translated into the proteins, which are the functional machines. And uh, the quick dogma is that you could only go from DNA to proteins, except AIDS pr proved that it's possible for certain viruses to go back and change the master blueprint. That's, the, that's what they mean by a retrovirus. 20 amino acids. Don't try to memorize them. But half of them are non-soluble, don't like water. And the others are... Uh, Hydrophilic, they, they're soluble, they like water. Of those, some of them are positively charged, they're basic, a couple are negatively charged, they're acidic. So the rest are neutral, the couple that are electrically charged. By these properties, they will determine the three-dimensional shape of the machine that results if you put them in a particular sequence. There are codes that define each of those amino acids. And even, there are even codes for punctuation, a start and stop and so forth. So you've got a whole language defined here. And part of the discovery of modern microbiology, they've been able to crack the codes, at least in part. And they are very systematic codes that define these particular amino acids. Now, I'll tell you what's interesting about the DNA is the code's been designed to be self-replicating. It can make copies of itself. These particular coded symbols, there's an alphabet of four, have, each one has a complementary pair. So if you split this apart, it will draw its complement intrinsically and become, thus, a copy of itself. And so that's what the, that's, that, that, this makes it intrinsically self-replicating code. This is genius at work. This didn't happen by chance. Come on, guys. Something most people don't know. When the DNA is going to be copied to an RNA, you want to copy this for the working copy, right? So you make a duplicate copy. Then you know what the, what the machinery does? It edits for equidistant letter sequences, just like we look for in the Bible. The messenger RNA will take certain portions of the DNA, or the, the, I should say the RNA that it gets, they call them introns, they cut those out, and the ones that are left are then spliced together, and that's what's sent to the machinery. Boy, there's elegant design going on here, and there's a lot of this we don't even understand why yet, but there's things going on here that so far have gone beyond our ability to understand. So you end up with this messenger RNA. So machinery comes along, and machinery is like a recording head. It will look at those codes, and it knows from those codes what protein to put together, and it puts that together. Then it looks at the next code, and adds another one, puts another one, and then another one. And so it creates a string of these amino acids, and then these amino acids will then shape themselves into a three-dimensional machine to go on and do some job. It's a protein chain which becomes a machine. Now, these amino acids, as I point out, some are soluble, some are not, and some are positively charged, some are not. And what happens, of course, is the negatively charged groups associated with positively charged groups, they draw together. The hydrophobic ones stack in the center, the hydrophilic ones go to where arrangements on the outside where the water will be, right? And so we finally have a three dimensional shape, which is the minimum energy conf uh, conformation of the thing, that's dictated by the sequence. So this thing is creating, from reading a diagram, it's creating the machinery to do jobs. Several hundred thousand different kinds of machines. Question, which came first, the protein or the DNA? You can't have the DNA without protein, and you can't get protein without the DNA. Do you see a problem here? There's no way for small parts of this to start by themselves. You need the whole thing organized day one. When you look at the mechanics of this, just the mechanics of it, you take the chromosome, and if you unravel that, you get what they call the condensed chromatin, and you unravel that, you discover as you look closer and closer, that it's actually a string of little packed uh, spindles. And the, the DNA is wrapped around it. As you magnify closer and closer, what's wrapped around this is the famous dual helix that makes up the DNA. Now, the question, to, to dramatize this for you, the way I like to put it, I want you to imagine me giving you two strands of monofilament fishing line, 125 miles long. You get the picture? 125 miles, two strands of fishing line. What I want you to do 
is figure out a way to store that inside a basketball. It'll fit. But I want you to be able to do it so that you can unzip it, copy it, and put it back in at three times the speed of an airplane propeller without tangling. <laughs> do you know what the most commonly read library in the world is? You. Your cells are reading your DNA continually to make materials to replace other materials. This is going on all the time. They go to the master library, they unzip the stuff, they make a copy of it, they put it back, send it to the processor, and they create these machines and so forth. This is going on continually in your cell, every cell of your body. Interesting. This all happened by chance? Come on. Genesis 1, 20, let's review with the passage for the evening. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly, the moving creature that hath life. Wow. And the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great sea monsters, or whales as it's translated here. And every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. And every winged fowl after his kind. After their kind. You notice that phrase all the time? Do you know why it's always after their kind? Because it's defined digitally. Not analog digitally. So within those kinds, they don't cross. So God saw and God saw that was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters and the seas and let the fowl multiply on the earth and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Now we could of course digress. There are thousands of examples from sea life we could talk about. Uh, and uh, there are, for example, did you know that fish have eyes that have a focal length? Uh, each one has a different focal length. The focal length is tuned to the food that they live off of. Do you know that? If it's close, small stuff, it's close, it's, it's, they're close, they're nearsighted. And if they're afraid of big stuff, they're, you know, they got... Now there is a fish that has a problem because it feeds on very small things, but it also knows that there are birds that are after it. It has bifocals. <laughs> they have bifocals so he can watch the sky and feed at the same time. So we could, we go, but the, well, I'm just going to pick one example of the sea, sea life thing because it's so popular to people. That's the dolphin. Okay, we've all seen the dolphins at San Diego or wherever. And uh, the dolphin is an incredible engineering feat. And we could go through the whole thing, but I'm going to take just one thing to talk about. There's a thing in the skull that's sometimes called the melon. And uh, I'm going to call it the sonar lens. Because the dolphin sends out sound waves, and the dolphin can receive those sound waves in this melon thing and know exactly what it is, where it is, and that's the way it gets its food. Now you say, well, gee, that's just a simple little thing. Not really, because that design has to account for the different speeds of sound in the water, in its skin, and in the melon itself, to the sensors that the, the, the acoustic engineering that's implied by this piece of sonar is staggering. But here's the real point I bring it up. How did the dolphin survive before it was functional? It would die. There's something very important to understand about dead animals. They don't evolve. <laughs> if he starves to death, there's no way to tell his children, better try something different. Okay. If he solves the problem somehow, how does he pass it on to his offspring? Is it going to be inherited? Not necessarily. See, the whole concept, of course, is specious that we're told. His sonar system involves sophisticated equations reconciling the velocity of sound through all different media, as I mentioned. And of course, he's dependent on those sound waves to get food. So I think we made those points. I will touch on one kind of creature that you may be surprised to find in the water today, and that's the dinosaurs. Land-based behemoth is the land-based dinosaur is mentioned in Job 40. The sea-based leviathan is, based, is talked about in Job 41. And in New Zealand in 1977, 900 feet down, a creature 32 feet long, 4,000 pounds, was hauled up by some Japanese fishermen. They did take some pictures. It was too big for them to do anything with, and they, they weren't equipped to drag it, so they took a lot of pictures and dumped it. But it's well known, and, and there are a lot of these pictures around, but I mentioned it, figured it would be kind of... But let me tell you about my favorite little creature. And that's the bombardier beetle. This guy is a cute little creature. A little beetle. It comes in several different varieties. He can stand up, and he's got an anus that he can turn in 270 degrees. He actually got a pair. 
And it's like a B-17 gunner, okay? <laughs> but what, what, the way he does this is rather impressive. He has two chambers inside him. One has some hydroquinone, and the other one has some hydrogen peroxide. And he has, if these two things mix together, it can be uh, disturbing. Not ex some people say explosive, that's a little overstated, but it's, it can be pretty hairy. But he also has an, what some people call the explosion chamber. And when he chooses to, he can mix the hydrogen peroxide with a catalase, an, an enzyme, and he mix the hydroquinine with an enzyme, and these speed up the oxidation, so when they get in the, in the explosion chamber, they go, the, the, the critics say it doesn't really explode. Well, it gets to 212 degrees and pops enough to rattle the frog or whatever's after him, okay? And he doesn't do this once, he can do it 20 times in a row. So it's a cross between a bomb and a machine gun, okay? And so when he, when he pulls this off, when he decides he's in trouble, you stand back, buddy. If you're in front of him, he'll shoot you. If you're anywhere around behind him, he'll nail you. And uh, the bomb, they call him the bombardier. It was named early when a bombardier was more like a grenade. We think of bombardier, we think of, you know, a little different concept. But anyway, that's, that's the label by which he goes. Interesting little creature. Now, what makes us so much fun is to have the uh, evolutionists try to explain how he learned all this stuff. Because if he doesn't do it right, he's going to blow himself to pieces. <laughs> and I, I want to remind you, the one thing that dead bugs can't do is they don't evolve, see? So when he makes a mistake somehow, there's no way to tell his children, okay? And the fact that he has a chamber that is structurally able to contain the blast itself is interesting. The fact that he has these steerable d tubes and the fact that he can use them with accurate skill the first time he does it. There's no learning takes place. He knows how to do it. This didn't happen by chance. You, you, you have a lot of fun trying to conjure up the evolutionist explanation how this all came about. And frankly, if they're honest with themselves, they don't have a good answer. Well, let's turn to birds. Birds are probably, in some respects, the ultimate engineering challenge. Because they fly, and man couldn't, right? And uh, we learned a lot about flying by looking at them. Got some mis misguidance because we don't have the facilities they have. And uh, I suppose the Wright brothers succeeded because they somewhat ignored what the, the birds and, and went at from scratch. We could spend a lot of time going through the architecture of the bird. But as we do, we would discover that every detail of the bird has been engineered for flight. Every detail. Things you never even thought of. The skeletons are lightweight. Many of them have hollow bones to save weight. Do you understand what an aeronautical engineer does to save weight? It's been done here. The fulcrum is fused, which has a couple of examples that helps absorb the shock of the wing flapping. It also helps him breathe, because he's got some breathing problems. He's, we'll come to the breathing problems in a minute. He lays eggs because carrying the young would make him too heavy. That's the reason birds lay eggs because it's external to their uh, 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 flight frame. The reproductive organs atrophy when it was, isn't in breeding season. They show up when they're needed, and they atrophy to minimal when they're not needed. It get, the physiology gets even more complicated. The birds have a highly intense metabolism. They have a high body temperature, 104 to 108 degrees Fahrenheit is typical. They have lungs that open at each end. And by the way, the feathers have a lot more to do than just flying. They're designed to keep them warm, when he, to, to control the body heat. The lungs are open at each end to have a flow through. We don't have that. They, have to, they breathe 450 breaths per minute compared to our nominally, say, 30. They, they have larger hearts if they're high altitude birds. They have, they beat, they, uh, their hearts beat from 400 to 1,000 beats per minute compared to our 160. So call, you know, it's, it's what, 20 times or more? The feathers, we could spend an evening talking about the engineering that goes on in a feather. They're there for our air, the bird can control each one. In three dimensions, not just like our aircraft do with the, uh, you know, flaps and stuff. They also control the body heat, which is critical. 
We could go through the feet, but to give you, to give you the quick summary of the feet, each bird has feet that are specifically designed for his particular lifestyle, whether it's in the water, under the water, what he's going after, whether he's got to dig, whatever, he's designed for it. And it's specifically designed for each bird. So we should take, uh, oh, and let's talk a little bit about the beaks. We go through all kinds of beaks. Here's the parrot beak, or actually it's a kestrel, I guess. Um, it, it's designed for pulling apart the prey that's too large to swallow. And uh, its, it's, it's hook appearance is typical of all birds of prey. And uh, the next one is the flamingo. It's got a curved beak for filtering small plants and animals from the surface water, ponds and so forth, uh, in which the beak is submerged. And then the bird pumps the lower bill against the upper and the food is drained out uh, in sort of a sleeve-like structure attached to the, uh, to the, the, the upper wall. And, uh, and then you have the uh, curlew, which is adapted for probing the shoreline for worms and such. And then you've got the parrot, which is a whole other thing, because he's designed for cracking nuts and eating fruit and that sort of thing, and uh, so forth. So, and then you have others. They have, few, few birds have teeth, so they can screen out the small things. But let's take the most interesting of them all. We'll just take one in detail. Let's take the woodpecker. Have you ever watched a woodpecker? These guys are astonishing. There's things about them that I never realized. They obviously have a very, very strong beak. That's just the beginning of his problems. His pounding is so hard that he'll lose his eyeballs if he doesn't close them. <laughs> Seriously. He closes his eyes. He has special cartilage between his beak and his head to help absorb the shock. So he goes home without a headache. Huh? <laughs> his tail feathers are designed to be a tripod with his two legs to help brace him for the shocks. Okay. They're designed for that. Unlike most birds who have three in front and one in back in terms of his toes, his are two and two so he can grip the bark of the tree better. He's designed for what he does. Now here's the wild one. He has a very unusual tongue because his tongue is longer than his beak because it's got to go inside in these tunnels to try to get the larva that he's after. So his tongue is incredibly long, has barbs on the end to grab what he's trying to grab. These larvae don't want to come out of that tunnel. And it also has a glue that the larva sticks to but doesn't stick to his tongue. Man, that takes some chemical engineering. You follow me? That's just the beginning of it. The European green woodpecker has a tongue that goes down the throat, out the back of the neck, around the back of the skull, beneath the skin, and over the top between his eyes, terminating just below the eye socket. Okay? <laughs> these, guys, these guys are designed for what they do. Now, I had hoped to get more time to do a little more research, but the more research I've done, I gather from the reading I've done, they still have no idea how birds migrate. They have studied magnetism, they've studied uh, uh, pressure, uh, uh, pressure analysis, currents, temperature. They have, there's all kinds of studies that have hints here and there, but to net it out for you, I personally uh, have not encountered, I welcome any rebuttals to the contrary, but I have not found any reliable documentation that explains how birds can find, can go 25,000 miles from birth to where they need to go, and how they do it is a mystery still to this day. I want to tell you about just one, it's my favorite for a number of reasons. That's the Siberian plover, the golden plover as he's called. Little tiny bird, little tiny guy. And uh, he does an interesting thing. The golden plover, here's his flight plan. His flight time is along the bottom in, in days. The weight of the bird is on the left scale. His fuel consumption is on the right scale. And he starts in Alaska and he goes to Hawaii. Now, what makes this particular flight interesting is that there's no rest stops. There's no place to rest between Alaska and Hawaii. That's just the beginning of his problems. He weighs 130 grams, okay? He is going to need a lot of fuel to do a quarter of a million wing flaps to get from Alaska to Hawaii. So the way he does it, he prepares for his trip by gaining some weight. And he will put on an additional, um, let's see, uh, 70 grams for fuel, okay? and you can calculate his fuel expenditure and when you do that you discover something very very interesting 
it takes 88 hours to get from Alaska to Hawaii, and he's got enough fuel so that he crashes into the sea in 72 hours. <laughs> Except for something else. If he didn't do anything else, he wouldn't make it. He doesn't have enough fuel to go 88 hours. He only has enough fuel to go 72 hours. But each year, he makes it to Hawaii. How does he do that? He makes it by flying in formation. By flying in formation, the ones that aren't the lead are saving fuel, and they trade off. You ever wonder what? You guys that car race cars, you know what drafting is, right? That's what the birds do. I never knew why birds always fly in this V formation. They're drafting, you know, what we would call in car racing, drafting. And they save about 20% of their fuel that way. In fact, the plover arrives in Hawaii with 6.8 grams margin for headwinds, okay? <laughs> So, you can tell I'm kind of a nerd. I, 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 got this, I got this stuff from Werner Gittin. I was just fascinated. I made a little charts and stuff. You get a great insight. This, the next, I do a lot of my stuff late, late at night or real early in the morning. I come down to breakfast. You know, Nan's made eggs or whatever. Let me show you. And I got these charts and the curves and the equations and so forth. I'm showing her. She looks at it right away and says, gee, that's interesting. That's just like us, isn't it? I says, what? We can't make it alone either. <laughs> she cut through all the equations, all the stuff for the application. See, you and I can't make it alone either. That's why we have fellowship. That's why the scriptures, we should not forsake the assembling together. We have diverse gifts and we each need. If you're not exercising your spiritual gift, you're defrauding the body. But... Uh, it's so, it's so characteristic. I'm all wrapped up in the equations, the numbers. She cuts right through it, you know, okay. She answers the so what question, right? Right there, right there. That's my bride. That's my bride. Well, just a little review last time, because I want to tie this together, what we had the time before, I should say the time before last. Remember when we took the vegetation, the anatomy of a leaf? We talked about the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, photosynthesis in two, two reactions, the light-dependent reaction and the light-independent reaction. We talked about how the two different uh, frequencies generate these chemical energy for the rest of it. And then the second part of the equation takes those chemical byproducts and produces glucose and uh, also throws off, uh, it, it needs CO2 in order to generate the glucose. Okay, here's my point. The plants generate O2 as a byproduct and the, the sugar, the glucose, right? More glucose than it needs it, that's why you can eat plants to they have excess. The animals, of course, need the sugar and the oxygen, right? The animals, of course, give off CO2, which the plants need to do in the first place. Now, there is CO2 in the atmosphere, but it would be a matter of time before the CO2 would be gone. Yes, it can be generated by lightning and by, by uh, certain, you know, uh, volcanoes and things, yes, but not enough. The animals are essential for the plants. The plants are essential for the animals. As an engineer, what does that tell you? They didn't happen by accident. They were designed to need each other. And you can build on this model the whole case of biodiversity. The ecologists love to tell us that all the different species need all the other species. No kidding. I wonder who designed it that way in the first place. And I wonder further, why is there all this concern about species going extinct if there's evolution going on? <laughs> and, and also in Krieg, when they, they talk about the ozone layer, boy, the ozone layer, if it changes one-tenth of one percent, it's going to be cosmic doom. Really? It's pretty sensibly balanced then, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Who balanced it? The argument that it's delicately balanced is an argument that it wasn't by chance. Somebody had to design it that way. Anyway, on we go. So, well, next time we will jump in, and uh, we, we, you know, as I mentioned, we, we've been through the Torah, went through day one, and then uh, Monday the heavens, and Tuesday the vegetation, Wednesday the planets. We were in Thursday this time. Next time when we meet, we will talk about animals in general, the, the land mammals, if you will, and of course the crowning achievement in a sense, and that's man. We'll talk about the fallacies and frauds 
often science goes haywire because of good, you know, well-intended misunderstandings. But this is a history of deliberate deceit and frauds littering the landscape. Almost, almost every one of the things you've heard about, Piltdown Man or whatever, were not only frauds, they were deliberate frauds. We'll talk a little further about the role of information in this process with some surprises for you when we get there. And we'll focus on the architecture of man. If you really understand our architecture, you'll begin to understand a lot more about our reality. And uh, that will set the stage, of course, for the seventh day, which will also have its surprises. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, <laughs> we, we just stand back in awe as we observe your handiwork. The awesome skill, the incredible elegance in every corner of our creation leaves us breathless, Father. As we survey the heavens, you are there. As we look through a microscope at the smallest leaf or the smallest microbe, or as we penetrate those structures that are even smaller than light itself, we, we, we just see your fingerprints on everything. How wonderful it is, Father. And we're staggered at ourselves that you have created us. And we're even more staggered as we realize how much you love us the extremes that you've gone to, not just to give us this world, but to redeem us from this world, to spend an eternity with you. Oh, Father, we just thank you for having revealed yourself to us in your word and in your creation. Indeed, Father, we recognize that the creation alone is enough to hold us accountable. And yet, Father, you've done so much more You've given us your word and your Holy Spirit to illuminate that word that we might discover our Redeemer, our Savior, the one through whom all these things were made and the one through whom all these things will be redeemed. Oh, Father, we just thank you. And Father, we would pray that you would help us to love you with all our heart soul, strength, and mind. Oh, Father, help us to comprehend and apprehend your love for us. Father, we would ask that through your Holy Spirit you would increase in each of us a new appetite, a new hunger for your word that we each might grow and live and be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities you put before us. Oh, Father, we ask all these things in response to the commandment and the authority of our Lord and King, Yeshua, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen.